Welcome to this, our complete dining guide to Cunard Line's incredible flagship, the Queen Mary 2. We're going to take you through a typical foodie day on board, starting with breakfast right through to that naughty midnight snack you'll be craving before bed. Now I know you're hungry to dive straight in, but before you do, please hit the old subscribe button for more Queen Mary 2 videos coming your way very soon, ish. Okay, we'll start with breakfast, which is a bit obvious really. Breakfast can be enjoyed a number of ways in this, the world's only ocean liner, so why not mix it up every day? Well, firstly, if you've been drinking and dancing the night away, and now come the morning after your legs refuse to work and there's a road drill mending potholes in your skull, you can have room service. If you have been drinking and dancing the night away, the challenge is to put this breakfast door hanger outside your stateroom before 11pm on the previous evening, or they'll not deliver. Oh well, if that happens, you'll have to drag your tired limbs to one of three directions. The Britannia Restaurant, the King's Court or the Corinthia Lounge. The laziest of these is the Britannia Restaurant, which serves breakfast with full waiter service between the hours of 8 and 9.30. I love this option if you have the time. It makes breakfast a proper dining experience, and I don't think you'd eat as much either compared to the help yourself style of the King's Court, which is a good thing, right? If you don't have the time and want to grab and go, or like the idea of grazing a breakfast you plate up yourself, then the King's Court Buffet is the main venue to do this. The variety here is vast and the food is fresh and well presented. The only things we found missing from our usual daily routine was granola and avocado. Oh, we love avocado on toast, and why no granola? I mean, it's the muesli of the millennial. Apart from that, you'll find most of the usual and not so usual breakfast foods here. If you fancy something a little different, and away from the hungry throng, then head to the Corinthia Lounge, as they have a small food bar where they serve small but delicious plates of something a little different to what's being served in King's Court. We loved this little area and it was quieter, ensuring a much more serene breakfast experience. On to lunch now, and again there are four main options and they are Britannia Restaurant, King's Court Buffet, Corinthia Lounge and the Golden Lion Pub. The dining experience is exactly the same as breakfast in each of the former three so I won't repeat myself but you can see for yourself in the following montage of the King's Court and Corinthia Lounge what you can expect. Oh, and I nearly forgot that if you're outside and the weather permits, the Boardwalk Cafe is open at the top deck from noon till four, serving burgers, fries and all that sort of stuff. Worth a visit if the weather's good. Lunch in the Golden Lion is for those who enjoy good old British pub lunch. The menu is designed around classic pub favourites and you can have a decent pint of some well chosen beers with it. After that, there's no time for getting hungry. And so if you have room in your ever-tightening clothing and you really can't wait for the evening, then afternoon tea is served in a number of ways. Ah, oh, sweet, sweet calories. Why do you tempt me so? 
Afternoon tea was introduced in England by Anna, the seventh Duchess of Bedford, in the year 1840. The Duchess would become hungry around four in the afternoon. At that time, it was usual for there only to be two main meals of the day, breakfast and an evening meal served around 8pm, thus leaving a long period of time in between. This kicked the whole terrible British custom off and it soon spread round to all her peers, reaching Cunard at some point. Afternoon tea in the Queen's room is deliciously unique to any other cruise line and is ideal to plug that gap if you're on a late evening dinner sitting. The ritual of the white-gloved waiters bringing round silver trays full of utterly delish and still warm scones with cream and jam, finger sandwiches and terribly addictive bite-sized cakes has been around for decades and it's something you should do at least once on a trip. Be warned though, on sea days it gets ridiculously busy and you'll have to queue to get into the Queen's room unless you turn up at least 10 minutes before service begins. It's totally worth it though. Other varieties of afternoon tea on board Queen Mary 2 are available. There's a champagne version, served in the champagne bar, which attracts a cover charge. There's a pub style one in the Golden Lion, although it wasn't available on our trip, but they serve traditional pub style finger food instead of normal afternoon tea. Finally, there's the relatively new Godiva chocolate afternoon tea, which is one we tried for you, our beloved viewers. <laughs> well, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it, right? The Godiva afternoon tea attracts a cover charge, and be warned, make sure you're a sweet tooth chocoholic for this one, as there's no savoury item served. As you can see from the video, it is indulgent in the extreme, and the Godiva goodies you get with it are utterly delicious. My only complaint is that if you choose to have coffee with it, not tea, they will only bring you one and you really do need at least a refill to help chow down all that richness. With a cover charge what it is, I'd at least expect a couple of coffees, but there you go, I'm splitting hairs a little, and I do advise you to ask for a glass of water, because you're going to need it. Okay, now we've rolled ourselves out of Sir Samuel's, there's only a couple of hours before evening dinner starts. So as an intermission to all this foodie fun, we'll go for a quick time-lapse run around the beautiful real teak promenade deck, to try and create a little room for the feast that awaits. As with most excellent restaurants, the evening service is usually when the chefs really get to flex their culinary muscles, and on Queen Mary 2 it's no different. You can dine in the Britannia, where they do two sittings at 6pm and 8.30pm, and also Britannia club guests are offered the luxury of open dining, which is you can eat when you like, but Britannia club stateroom fares are higher than the standard, so you do pay for this flexibility. Britannia evenings, and we've experienced well over a hundred of them, are always, in our opinion, a lovely experience. There's something about Cunard dining that sets it apart from its peers. The waiters are very smart, the service is nearly always with a friendly smile, and because you tend to sit in the same table every evening, you get to know your waiters quite well, and the food is always very good. I don't think we've ever had a less than pleasing meal here. And the only negative I can think of is the dining times. 6pm is often too early if you've been out and about or the weather is still warm and sunny outside, and 8.30pm is always too late and you find yourself snacking heavily around 5pm because, well, you know, this is cruising, right? And perhaps one of Cunard's most significant, and some would say controversial changes to its dining in recent years has to be the Veranda, formerly the Todd English restaurant and now formerly the Veranda too. Well, the Veranda as we knew it. The only speciality dining restaurant on Queen Mary 2 is now known as Steakhouse at the Veranda. Effectively, they've scrapped the fiddly French-focused fine dining menu for a more informal meat and seafood heavy alternative, for a slightly less cover charge than before. The menu is what you kind of expect from a chop house style they're going for here. Dishes such as clam chowder, salt beef brisket hash and Caesar salad could have all been lifted straight from the Thomas Keller menu on the Seaborne ships. Entrees are beef heavy, with steaks of the finest quality being the main events, but there is also a seafood option if a chunk of cow is not not quite your thing. It's all done quite theatrically, from the cuts of meat being presented to you to inspect before ordering, 
to selecting your own knife from a tray of various lethal steelwork. Although the knife sommelier was left a bit bemused when I asked him what knife he recommended. <laughs> you can always count on me to ask the dumb questions. The meal itself, as you can see from the video, was very good indeed and we'd definitely be coming here again. The 8 ounce fillet felt a lot bigger than 8 ounces and we both struggled to finish our mains. The desserts were as American as apple pie. In fact, mine was apple pie. They were large and tasty, but not the most refined food we've ever eaten. In fact, that goes for the whole meal. While immensely enjoyable, to compare it to the delicate and refined veranda would be like comparing the sport of golf to a game of chess. There's no way you can reconcile the two. Lastly, if you've still not had enough calories to last you until morning, the King's Court will always rustle you up a midnight snack after a late show if you have the munchies. Coming up here late at night is always fun, but calorifically deadly. Well, all those delicious desserts, cookies and cheeses won't eat themselves, will they? We've come to the end of our Queen Mary 2 dining guide and we hope you've enjoyed what's been on offer. We've covered everything we could on our short cruise, but we are aware we haven't covered grills dining, the speciality evenings they regularly lay on in the King's Court, or those two other afternoon tea varieties. Still, it gives us an excuse to come on and do it all again. Thank you for watching, and before you go off and get a crafty snack after watching this, please hit the old subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. It will make our now wobbly tummies all the more worth the trouble. Thank you.